Blues Brothers, a wonderful ride. Motion and emotion, yeah. John comes from Wheaton, Illinois. Married his high school sweetheart, Judy. Wheaton, Illinois, 26 miles west of Chicago. I was going into my sophomore year in high school, and um, John was going to be a senior. And we took out some boats, a group of kids, and we were having a water fight, and he came back and hit me with the oar and showed much concern. Phoned me that night to see how my arm was. It was okay. Quick conversation. He phoned the next night and said, how's your arm? Got a laugh out of me. Kept calling. How's your arm? How's your arm? And finally he invited me to homecoming dance. I went with him and he became king. John wasn't doing the best in school, but he had that spark. And all the teachers liked him and they wanted to help him. And uh, they did. He wanted to play football <laughs> originally when I met him. That was probably his main goal. And he was very tough. He was a linebacker. But it was, he was already beginning to get interested in theater. And I always thought, well, if he went into theater, he'd probably be like someone like Frank Sinatra, you know, like someone who would, you know, use music and act and be very successful. Um, certainly through the years, I was prepared for the fact that it was more likely that if he actually stayed with acting, that we would probably not have a financially secure life. He promised me if he couldn't make a living with acting by the time he was 30, that he would quit and get a real job. April 1st, 2004, we got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for Mr. John Belushi. And we picked April 1st because it's April Fool's Day. And what better day to honor my brother than April Fool's Day. My first uh, nickname for him was Cookie, uh, from the Cookie Monster. He, he had such a great face and such a way about him. When I think about him, he was like something out of a storybook for children because his sensibility was one, and Dan shares this, of just utter and complete generosity. The night that John got you know, lost, he, uh, we couldn't find him, and the, the mall was abandoned, and there was grass growing up in the parking lot, and there was sort of a path there, the only path. We couldn't find him. We were shooting in the mall, 3 in the morning, needed to get a shot, look around. He's not there. I follow the path, go out to the suburb. I look. It's all, you know, suburban houses, all dark, but down like two or three blocks, I see a light on, like the only guy up. And so I walk, and I knock on the door. I say, ah, we're shooting a movie. I'm an actor in this film down the road, and we're missing one of our players. And little John Belushi, yeah, he came into my house about an hour ago, ready in my fridge, he's asleep on the couch. He was America's guest, you know. He just, I mean, who, who could walk in, like, just to any house like that? And, and, uh, and I woke him up and said, John, we got to go back to work. Ah, uh, light up a cigarette, go back to work. And then we screeched around the mall for, for that entire night. <laughs> Disco pants and haircuts. Yeah. I know that the metamorphosis of Jake, uh, from John to Jake, started in Eugene, Oregon, when we were shooting Animal House. We went out one night to see a local group. There was a young guitar player named Robert Cray, and he had another fellow with him, Curtis Salgado, who played harp and sang. And we were kind of attracted to him because he reminded us of Danny. And he started talking with Curtis, and he was so enthusiastic, and they became friends. And Curtis was this, I mean, he was 19, I think, and he, he was just an encyclopedia of blues and uh, soul and rhythm blues. And he would come with armloads of tapes or records, and they'd sit and listen to, to everything. And then John started making tapes. He'd have his own tapes in his pockets and carrying them around. And, and the more that he got into it, the more he liked it and um, started singing along, as he would. He always liked music. He could put across that material with the legitimacy that would make guys who had made some of the original records that we were covering, he could make these guys stand up and say, yeah, there's a performance. John would go into a record store and buy like 50 records. If he told them about uh, Floyd Dixon, he'd go buy all his albums. If he'd hear about Robert Johnson, he had to get everything he could find. He, he lived that blues life for a while. You know, Jake, the character is a hard-ass bluesman, and that's it. That's his life. And, and John, you know, spent the time where he would go around the clubs and just be in search of the music. And that was his mission, just to find out all he could about the music. John used to always say in the concerts, uh, I advise each and one of you to get out and buy as many blues albums as you can. 
John was much more disorganized than Dan. Um, John was much more spur of the moment than Dan. They took a couple cross-country trips in, uh, together over the Saturday night years, where just the two of them drove. And um, Danny says that he fashioned a lot of what came about the relationship when they drove. And even their relationship in general came out of those trips. And, and where John would always be yelling at him for driving too fast and slow down when he's trying to kill us and doing those kind of throwaway things like the lighter if it doesn't work out the window. Where's the Cadillac? The caddy. Where's the caddy? John was an extremely gifted, larger than life personality. Very, very funny. Very, very sweet. To make the impact John did in such a short time is quite remarkable. He was brilliant on camera, kind of unpredictable in the rehearsal process, but then it just he would just ignite on, on screen. You were the backbone, the nerve center of a great rhythm and blues band. I don't think you can achieve the kind of heights that he achieved in his sadly short life uh, without having that kind of drive. You can make that live, breathe, and jump again. I do have one personal story. My dad was a captain of a submarine in the Second World War. And John loved talking about that, that war. So on a trip coming out to LA, he was, of course, in first class, but could never sit still. And it just so happened my parents were in coach in the back of the aircraft. Those were the days where you could walk the airplane up and down, saying hi to everybody. And on one of these trips back to the back of the aircraft, my mom said to him, um, uh, John Belushi? Yes, I'm Deborah Nadulman's mother. And he sat with my parents for the rest of the flight, asking my father about what it was like being in the submarine. And Belushi couldn't get enough of it. And they came off the flight together. But it's typical John story. Sat with my parents, with my parents for the rest of the flight. And he was fascinated. Right now, I just completed, actually, handing in a draft of a book called Belushi. It's a compilation of interviews. I started collecting a year after John died. It is just trying to tell the story that I believe, you know, is re reflective of, of, of the complex man he was. I thought when John died, it was over, and here we are, 25 years later. It's been an incredibly uh, wonderful, wonderful adventure the whole time. And of course, as I say, when I walk into my nightclub there, you know, in Las Vegas at the top of the Mandalay Bay Hotel with the view of the Strip, do I think of Johnny or what? Wow. Because, you know, we're living like Elvis and Sinatra there. And wouldn't he love it, you know? John loved a good time anywhere. You know, he was, he was a good man and a bad boy. People tell me how grateful they are to him for, for, for introducing them to the music. Just whatever level it is that people feel like he touched them on, they want to tell me. And it's, it's really quite, uh, quite a lovely thing. One thing I can say about my brother John, he was really funny. Funny! He had a funny face, he had funny expressions, he said things funny. I ran out of gas. I had a flat tire. I, I didn't have enough money for cab fare. My tux didn't come back from the cleaners. An old friend came in from out of town. Someone stole my car. There was an earthquake, a terrible flood. Locust, it wasn't my fault, I swear to God. Just piss ass funny.